good days I've had some hills to climb I've had some weary days and some sleepless nights but when I Praise the Lord this morning. Amen. It's so good to see so many young people in church this morning. Praise God. Amen. We pray for our young people all the time. For they're going through a troublesome time in this world, in this country. And we pray that God would station an angel all around them. And they might be protected on every side. This morning you have heard the scripture reading in your hearing and it's from the book of Mark chapter 16 verses 1 through 8. So we give honor to our bishop and our pastor of this great house that he once again has started not robbery to allow me to stand behind the sacred desk. So we say thank you for that on this Easter Sunday morning. Amen. Amen. We thank all of those who have gone before me, reading of the scripture by Dr. Garrison, the prayers, uh, the deacons and the ministers who sit in their tent doors and pray for me as I prepare to preach God's word. So we thank all of you. We thank all of you for being here in the presence of a holy God. It's interesting to note that this year, this season, that Jewish Passover coincides with Christian Resurrection Sunday. It overlaps. The Jewish Passover lasts for eight days. We celebrate the Resurrection Sunday on one day. And I think in itself that's not enough, but that's what we do. We celebrate Resurrection Sunday on one day. The Jewish Passover started on Wednesday, April the 5th at sundown. And it goes on through Thursday, the evening of April 13th of this year. And we thank God that those two things coincide for the, Jew the Jewish Passover is all about the death angel passing over because of the blood on the doorposts and sparing the firstborn. The Christian resurrection celebration celebrates and praises God for giving us his firstborn, that his shed blood might save us from our sins. Our Christian heritage is rooted and founded in the Jewish Christian, belief, Christian beliefs. And we thank God for it. For if we look at it, we can uncover the heritage of our faith. If you've been in the church for more than one Easter, you probably know the Easter story and how it goes. But just in case, you're missing any of the facts. I'm here to share it with you this morning. All right. Walk with me through the text. When God is ready to make a special announcement, he sends forth a messenger angel. In Genesis chapter 19, we see that an angel brought the message of destruction 
to Sodom and Gomorrah. In the book of Judges, chapter 13, we see that an angel announces the birth of Samson. In Luke chapter 1, an angel announces the birth of John the Baptist. In Luke chapter 2, however, an angel announces the birth of Jesus Christ. I have entitled this message, The Message from the Tomb. The message from the tomb. The announcement of the angel in our text today is the gospel message. From within the tomb, which is the same place that both received and gave up Jesus Christ's body. Jesus went to the tomb dead, but he came out alive. It's a picture and a symbol of the church today. It's what's supposed to be happening in the church. That you might show up spiritually dead. But before you leave because of the power of the Holy Spirit, you might be made alive. And a new creature in Christ. Look at the text. It's Friday. The evening of Friday, Jesus has been crucified. He's hung on the cross for nine hours, and after saying, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. The Bible says that he breathed his last breath, and he dies. Now the clock is ticking, because the sun is about to go down, S-U-N. The sun is about to go down. And the sun, S-O-N, is about to rise. The Sabbath will begin at the evening hour. And those followers of Jesus will be restrained from taking care of the dead body of our Savior. Time is of the essence. They got to get Jesus down from the cross and into the grave because if they don't get him off the cross by sundown, his body will be burned by the Romans. A man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea, he goes to Pilate and he asks for permission to take down the body of Jesus and they're in such a hustle because time is running out before the sun goes down that they won't be able to properly anoint the body and perform all of the rituals of burial. There's also a man by the name of Nicodemus. You know him. He came to Jesus by night. But this time he comes and he assists Joseph of Arimathea in taking care of the body. And he provides the spices to anoint the body. You can read about that in John 19. So they take him and they wrap him in a burial cloth and they put him in a tomb. They don't have time for all of the rituals. They don't have time to anoint the body, which is something that's critical to delay the decay of the body in a culture that did not have embalming services. It was the custom of that day, you see, to anoint dead bodies with aloe and spices and myrrh to create an aroma that would sweeten up the odor produced by a dead body. Even though this preparation, preparation was in an act of love and devotion, the overall intent was to make death smell sweet. Uh, contrary to popular belief, and how many of you, I'm sure you know, you can't sweeten up death. They went to the tomb to make death smell good. But Jesus, on the other hand, had another plan. He planned that death would not smell good, but that it would be eliminated altogether. So they lay him to rest on Friday evening. Saturday, the chief priests go to Pilate, and this is what they say. Pilate, this man called Jesus, who was a deceiver, 
He prophesied that he would rise up again in three days. And the only way that that's not going to happen is if the disciples go to the graveyard and steal the body. If they steal the body, they're going to start a rumor saying that he's risen from the dead. Pilate, we need you to do us a solid. We need you to do us a favor and lock down the tomb to be certain that the body does not get out. Pilate says, here's what I'll do. I know how to lock down the tomb. We'll put a stone in front of it. Then we'll put the governor's seal on the stone. And then we'll put a soldier on the outside to guard the tomb. For you see, if there's a stone and a seal and a soldier, that body ain't going nowhere. So they lock down the tomb with a stone and with a seal and with a soldier, which happens on a Saturday. The Bible says that on the first day of the week, and as you know, that's Sunday morning, at dawn, early Sunday morning, Mary, a Magdalene, and a few others, Marys, decided to go to the tomb to finish what could not be done on Friday and anoint the body. While they were making their way there, they realized they had a few issues to deal with in order for them to complete their mission. They had to overcome the storm. They had to somehow remove the sea. They had to otherwise confront the soldier. For you see, the stone is a problem that's got to be moved. The seal represents a power that has to be changed. And the soldier is a person that has to be confronted. Don't miss it. We got a few problems in the midst of this anointing. We got a stone that's got to be moved. We got a seal that's got to be challenged. We got a soldier that needs to be changed. We don't know how we're going to deal with the problem that needs to be moved. We don't know how we're going to deal with the person that needs to be confronted. And we don't know how we're going to move that stone out of the way. We got some issues in trying to anoint the body of Jesus. But they go on anyway and anyhow. And here's the first gospel good news. By the time they get to the tomb, God has already beat them there. And they find that everything that they were worried about, God had already taken care of. Can we speak for a few moments? The stone has been rolled away. The soldier has been restrained. The seal has been removed. The seal which symbolizes Pilate's power has been removed. The soldier has been restrained. The stone has been rolled away. And I come to tell you this morning, somebody today, that whenever God is about to do something miraculous in your life, there is no power, there is no person, there is no problem that God cannot handle. God's got a way of doing things before you even arrived. He's able to deal with powers, you see, that stand against you. Somebody needs to know that because every now and then you got some problems that stand in your way, some rules that shouldn't uh, bind you, some stereotypes that deny you from your blessing. Sometimes even some issues that say no to your very existence. Dilemmas that you can't handle. Sometimes you'll have some powers that will try to overcome you. But we serve a God who is able to move mountains and remove powers that stand against you. To break rules that bind you in order that he might bless your life. God knows how to put folk where you
you say they can't be in the places that they should be. The Bible says that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. God said in Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Say the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil to give you the expected end that I have prepared for you. God knows how to deal with mountains and powers. God also knows how to deal with some people. If you haven't found out yet, every now and then, you got to deal with some people. Some jealous people. Some envious people. Some bitter people. Some negative people. Some hateful people. Some disrespectful people. Every now and then, if you haven't already done so, you got to deal with some people. Have you ever found that some of your friends were fake? But all of your enemies were real. God, the God we serve, is able to restrain some folks. He is able to hold some folk back from doing you harm. The Bible says in Psalm 3, Many are they that rise up against me, but thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. Has God ever shielded you from some folk? Has God ever lifted your head? Has God ever prepared a table before you in the presence of your enemies? He can deal with powers. He can deal with some people. And he can deal with any of your problems. God is an almighty God. If you just live one more day, not only will you deal with some powers, not only will you deal with some people, but you're going to deal with some problems. There will be some sicknesses in your life that you can't handle. There will be some issues that you can't control. Some financial situations that are beyond your ever-loving means. You're going to experience some problems in your life. We will experience problems in this life, but there is some good news, I tell you. We serve a God who can move mountains and roll stones away. God specializes in obstacles that stand in your way. My Bible tells me in Matthew 28 and behold, there was a great earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and he sat upon the stone. I just stopped by to tell somebody that if you are a true child of God, he will remove the whole world to move a problem out of your way. We serve a moving God. Nothing can stand in his way. He is a stone roller. He is a problem solver. He is a healer. He is a deliverer. He is a refuge for those who need a hiding place. God can handle your problems. No matter what the problem is. No matter who the person is. No matter what power is in your way like these women were faced with. Go on. Anyway, you might find out that God has handled every problem. God has handled every power. God has handled every person before you even get there. God says if you're going to worry, don't pray. If you're going to pray, don't worry. God can handle it all. All he wants you to do is trust in him. Depend on him. He wants you to lean to his wisdom and not to your understanding. Our understanding hasn't helped us this far. What makes you think it's going to help us in the future? God wants you to trust and depend on him. Go on. Anyway, you don't know what the doctors are going to say. Make the appointment anyway. You don't know how the meeting is going to turn out. Show up and sit down at the table anyway. You don't know how that evaluation that your supervisor is writing is going to turn out. Go to the supervisor anyhow. Because we serve a God who is able to handle problems. He is able to handle people. And he is able to handle whatever issues stand before you. We serve an almighty God. Yes, 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 we serve an almighty God. 
if you're standing in fear right now because there's something that's standing in your way, don't worry about it. Just get on your knees and pray about it. And God will show up and take care of the problem and the person and the issue that stands in your way. We serve a mighty God. We serve a mighty God. We serve a God that can do anything except fulfill. Serve him and praise him this morning. It's Easter Sunday. These women, when they arrive at the tomb, they find out that God has already handled all of the issues that they worried about. And there is an angel who gives them a message and a mission. Straight from the tomb. The angel says, go tell the disciples Christ is risen. And while they're leaving to go find the disciples, the Bible says that the soldiers were there and they ran to the priest and the soldiers told the priest everything that had happened, that they had been restrained, that the seal had been removed and the stone had been rolled away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the priests devised a plan. They're scheming, you see. And they said, tell everybody that the disciples came and stole the body late last night. So on the first day of the week, early Sunday morning, there are two reports that go out from the graveyard. The women are saying, are saying the body was stolen. The men and the women of that day were put in the same dilemma that we are into this day. Whose report are you going to believe? Is he risen or is he still dead? Uh, this is an either or situation. There is no middle ground. The resurrection of Jesus Christ draws a line in the sand. And every man, every woman, and every child that has reached the age of accountability has to stand on one side or the other. Either he's the resurrected Savior or he's a dead liar. Either he's Lord or he's a scam artist. Either he has been risen or he's still in the grave. This is the critical issue for you and me as believers because the Apostle Paul said that if Christ is not risen from the dead, we are the most miserable of all people. If Christ is still dead, Everything that we do, everything that we preach, everything that we read in the Bible is all for vain. Is he risen or is he dead? That is the question that we must answer today definitively in our hearts and in our minds. Do we believe that Christ is risen from the dead? That is the issue. Uh, can I arm you and equip you to deal with the atheistic co-worker that you're going to face tomorrow morning? Uh, who's going to question why you went to church to serve a dead savior? I'm about to put in your hands some indisputable evidence that Jesus is alive and alive forevermore. How do you know, preacher, that he's alive? I'm glad you asked that question. When the woman come back to tell the disciples that Christ is risen, according to the Gospel of Mark, the disciples did not originally believe them. In order to verify whether he was alive or dead, this is what John the Apostle says. The disciples ran to the tomb to look for themselves because in their mind the easiest way to determine whether he's alive or dead is to 
see if the body is still there. If we can see his dead body, we know he's not risen. Beloved, the easiest way to settle this issue, this matter of the death or resurrection of Jesus Christ is very simple. Produce the dead body. Produce the dead body. If the body of Jesus can be produced, imagine the eternal victory that Satan would have. If the body of Christ can be produced, then the Bible should be thrown in the garbage. If the body of Christ can be produced, every cross ought to be removed from every church. If the devil can produce the body of Jesus, we should shut the front doors, stop singing Amazing Grace, and accept the fact that we are lost in our trespasses and sins and on our way to hell. It seems to me that if the enemy of righteousness wants to shut down the body of Christ, his number one agenda ought to be to produce the body of Jesus. Even with all of the scientific technology that exists today, the one thing that has never been found is the body of Jesus Christ. Not even his skeletal remains. Just think about it for a moment. We found the Titanic at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. We found the grave of Tukak Common in Egypt. We found the Dead Sea Scrolls. We found the Rosetta Stone. We found Hitler's hidden bunker. We found the ancient city of Troy. We have found the Shroud of Turin, which covered the body of Jesus. We have found the remains of the city called Jericho. Society has made these historic finds, but the one thing that has never been produced is the body of Jesus Christ. It's not complicated. It's very simple. The dead body of Jesus can't be found because Jesus ain't dead. He's not dead this morning, I tell you. He's alive forevermore. He's alive and he lives forevermore. How do you know that, preacher? The Bible says that after Jesus rose, it was 40 days from Easter to the ascension of his body. During those 40 days, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says that all the apostles saw him. He was seen by people. He was seen by the 12. And after that, the 12 again. He was seen by 500 at one time. And after the 500, he's seen by James. And after James, he's seen by all the apostles. And then Paul says, finally, I saw him myself on the road to Damascus. So can nobody tell me that he's dead in a tomb? For he lives and he lives forevermore. But even if all those facts don't convince you, there's a fact that's standing here right in this pulpit. I testify this morning that Jesus is alive and well and he sits high and he looks low. He knows your uprising and your down sitting. He knows you're going out and you're coming in. All you got to do is call out to Jesus and he will show up. He will show up even before you call his name. He will then be there to solve your problem. He will be there to move the stones out of your way. He will be there and then some. He's alive. He's alive this morning, I tell you. He's alive. All of the apostles saw the resurrected Jesus. And each one of them died a horrible death. When they could have saved themselves by simply denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ they chose not to do so and they all suffered horrible deaths because they would not deny Christ Matthias who was the one who replaced Judah who committed suicide he was burned to death 
James, the brother of John, and Paul, both of them were decapitated. Thomas and Matthew were stabbed to death and bled out and died. Philip and Bartholomew were beaten with sticks until they died. James was stoned until he died. John was thrown into a pot of boiling oil. Andrew was crucified. And Peter was crucified upside down. Who, who would believe a lie and go to their death in such a horrible fashion? Who would believe a lie? It must have been true. It is true. How do you know? Because you're here and I'm here. All of these preachers and deacons and worshipers are here this morning. Why? To celebrate the death, burial, and most importantly, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are here to testify this morning that Jesus is alive and alive forevermore. For you see that any man that be in Christ, come on help me church, he's a new creature in Christ. While he was living, he loved me. While he was dying, he saved me. While he was buried, he carried my sins far away. While he was rising, he justified me. And one day, he's coming back. He's coming back for you and for me. Get your house in order. Notice the signs of the time that Jesus is on his way back. He's on his way back looking for that church without spot or wrinkle. He's coming to look for someone just like you to receive him up to himself. For he said, if I go, I will come and receive you again. That I might take you to the place that I have prepared for you. For I have prepared many mansions, mansions for each and every one of you. If you're ready and you got your house in order, be on the lookout for Jesus Christ. Because one day he's going to crack the ever loving sky and he's going to step down on a mountain and he's going to call you by a name that you never heard before. But when you hear that name, you're going to stand up. And though shall rise first and we who are alive shall be caught up to meet them in the end. He's coming back I tell you Jesus is alive and alive forevermore. Amen. Amen. at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and for me. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. 
if you believe in Jesus Christ and that God had raised him from the dead, the Bible says that thou shalt be saved. If you've given testimony this morning to the fact that he is alive forevermore and you receive him into your heart as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says that you are saved. There's nothing more that you have to do or say. Just believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you shall be saved. I take it not for granted that everyone's saved in this house, so we extend the lifeline. Christ opens his arms and his heart to receive you. And if there's one here this morning that wants to exceed, receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, you can come now. You can come now and accept him. Amen. Praise God this morning. Is there another this morning? Is there another this morning that wants to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Time is growing short. He's about to return. And you may not have the next moment, the next second, to say yes to Jesus. And if you haven't said yes, this is the appointed time. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For I can let you know now that he is real. He is real. It doesn't matter what your friends say. It doesn't matter who looks at you strange. For God said, we are a peculiar people. Why don't you come boldly to the throne of grace and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. And I confess that fact this morning. And I want to accept you as my Lord and Savior that I might be saved. You can do it right now. There's no better time than this very moment to accept Christ. I pray that you won't allow this moment to escape you. For you might not get the opportunity again. We don't know what's going to happen when you go out this door. We don't know what's going to happen even as you sit in the church pews. We don't know. Only God knows. But I do know this. That because you're still alive at this moment, he's given you a brand new opportunity to say, yes, Lord. Yes. Is there anyone else that would receive Christ this morning? And if not, there might be someone here this morning that's looking for a church home, a place where they can fellowship with like saying believers, a place where they can pray and worship, a place where they can feel the very presence of God, a place where they can learn and study the Bible, a place where they have prayer for one another, a place where they can find peace and sanctity in the presence of a holy God. If you're here right now and you desire a church home, Philadelphia Christian Church Ministries might be the place for you. And if you want to worship in this local assembly, the bishop and the pastor of this great house would receive you with open arms and this church would give you the right hand of fellowship that you might become a member of this branch of Zion and serve in one body in Christ. Is there one right here? Is there one? Amen. Amen and amen. To that bishop, 
Alaskans. To the church, we have Sister Wanda is looking for a church home. And she come today because she would love to become a member of this church. Amen, amen, praise God. Praise God this morning. Praise she, God. She's coming today because she wants to renew her life to Christ. She had said that she would ask the church to accept her to become a member of this church. We accept you with open arms, sister. church to stand and welcome Sister Wanda. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. We offer Christ. Amen. We'll go right into our second part of the service. 
but we invite our media partners if you want to, if you heard something or if you want to support this ministry, go to our, our YouTube, uh, YouTube or go to our website, which is uh, PCCM, PCCMonline.org, and support us even financially. Uh, with uh, on their cash app and send us a donation so we can continue to keep this ministry going in the house as well out of the house of God. Amen. We want to also ask, tell you, tell your friends to click on it so you can look at the service that took place today. Amen. Amen. Now we're ready to go. I got some. I got some bulls in, 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 the, in the pen ready to sing and want to take us off the air. He's sitting there with his little white on and his blue. And I know he's just like a bull ready to sing. Come on up here. Dig it, Charlie. Yeah, he, he and I, look, we were on the phone one o'clock in the morning. I said, Dig it, Charlie, you wearing your white? He said, I'm wearing my white. I said, I'm wearing mine too. He said, but Pastor, I didn't call you. Because I know you were going to have your white suit on, so I knew. I, I didn't know need to call you. But that's my friend, the deacon, amen. And again, I thank all of you, Reverend Garrison, and, uh, amen. The Reverend Dr. Brown, thank you so much, amen, for worship leading. And uh, I want everybody to stand. Come on, and let's uh, sit so long until next Sunday to our media ministry. Amen. And we sing a little song. I'm going to let put it on the mic so you can get a little share. And say amen. We can all just sing this song. Thank you.